the center is uh, something that takes a lot of people to, to support us. So we really appreciate it. And uh, to, obviously these centers are more important than ever around the country given the things that are happening. And we're, we're affiliated with the US Holocaust Museum to also and we get help from them in different ways so we really appreciate that as well. So with all those thank yous, and if I left anybody out, I apologize. I am very pleased to be able to introduce our presenter, Faris Cassell, who is going to be discussing her new book, The Unanswered Letter. This is an amazing work of research, which you may know just recently received two national first place prize, prize first placed prizes, one from the Jewish Book Council and the other from the Association of Journalists and Authors. So we can tell that it's very well appreciated by the professionals, you know, as well as uh, the reader, other readers. Um, Faris has been a writer for the Eugene, Oregon Reg Register Guardian. I think I said that right. And um, she earned a BA bachelor's in history. I'm a history major, so I appreciate that. From Mount Holly uh, College in our area, even though she's out in Eugene and where she got her MA uh, in journalism from the University of Oregon. So from one part of the country to the other. Uh, but she knows both areas. And um, she worked on this, this is her first book for a number of years. Um, also in uh, participating in the discussion is Ferd Wolken, who lives in Western Mass, works at University of Massachusetts Amherst and as a union organizer. And as you will hear, he plays a pivotal role in the research that Farris was able to do that culminated in this great book. So I wanna end my introduction by just quoting from a reviewer, a wonderful um, quote, which really encompasses what this book is all about. Uh, the reviewer says, a caring and compassionate journalist and writer, Cassell has crafted a highly engrossing, historically contextualized story of one family as she helps us grasp the enormity and complexity of the Holocaust. I don't think we can say anything more about this book. Uh, and so without further ado, introduce uh, Faris Cassell. Hi, thanks, Ron. Thanks, Gary, for Lori, all your work. I so much appreciate it. Um, this is the book about Ferd's family, about Ms. Jan. Yes. This is a book about um, Ferd's extended family, That's definitely. No. Are we set here? Yeah. OK. Um, so. The, the book is The Unanswered Letter, One Holocaust Family's Desperate Plea for Help. Um, it begins with a letter, actually, uh, that came into my life um, unexpectedly over about a decade, over a decade ago now. It was written by a Viennese Jewish man, Alfred Berger, to strangers in America in August of 1939. August of 1939, um, historians among you may know, was um, just at the, um, in the tense run up to the um, opening of World War II in Europe. So Alfred Berger had been underneath Nazi uh, occupation, Nazi rule, for a year, and Jews were flooding out of Austria, trying to find a safe place um, to go. Countries had uh, slammed shut their door to the flood of refugees, and um, Alfred Berger was desperate. So he is writing to, he had no contacts in America who might offer him um, sponsorship to immigrate. So he's writing to a stranger, a stranger with the same last name, um, hoping that this stranger will have um, pity on him and, um, and sponsor him. So the letter begins, Dear Madam, you are surely aware of 
the situation of all Jews in Central Europe, and this letter will not astonish you. By pure chance, I got your address. And he goes on to explain that he, his daughter and her husband will be able to immigrate soon. That his, the Berger son-in-law has a relative in America who can sponsor just one family. So Alfred Berger is desperately searching for another sponsor. And in this letter, he begs a stranger to sponsor him. He closes his letter saying, I beg you once more, help us to follow our children. It is our last and only hope. So this letter came into my life when my husband brought it home from his office one day. He's a physician and his one of his patients brought it into him saying, um, I think you probably would know what to do with this better than I do. She said that her family had received it in 1939 and the family had saved it and so the letter came down to my husband's patient. So he brought it home and showed it to me. At the time I read it, I really knew almost nothing about the Holocaust except what what you know the general public might know and Frank and and thing you know just newspaper articles nothing in depth but I read this letter and um, I was so deeply moved by it um, it just seemed to haunt it haunt me and the the Despite the, the years that had passed, it felt like uh, I was holding a life in my hands. The questions in the letter just seemed to fly off the page. I wanted to know, reading that letter, holding that letter, I wanted to know if the American family had responded. What had they done? Had they sponsored Alfred and Hedrick? And I wanted to know whether Alfred and Hedwig had immigrated, and if not, had they survived the Holocaust in, in Vienna? So with questions just swirling around my, uh, in my mind, um, I asked my husband to arrange for me to interview his patient whose family had received the letter. I wanted to know what, what they had done with it. So I talked to, to his patient and discovered right away that the family had not responded to the letter. They had saved it. They were moved by it. It had touched them. And his, my husband's patient was actually quite desperate to find out what had happened. And as I was leaving her home, she, she touched my arm and looked me in the eyes and said, tell me what happened. Tell me what you find out. So with that as a start, I began to research this letter. Um, the letter had a second page also, which showed that Alfred Berger uh, was born in 1877, which would have made him um, about 62 when he wrote this letter. He is, puts himself down as a merchant man. His, his, um, occupation, which told me that he was uh, an average person, just an ordinary person. He wasn't famous. He wasn't um, a celebrity or, or rich. He was asking a stranger to help him because he had no other resources. Here is his wife's uh, information, Hedwig Berger. She's a bit younger, um, age 50 when the letter was written. And um, her occupation is that she's a seamstress, a, de a dressmaker, and she's uh, skilled in all household works. Um, I, I love all these, these descriptions, which are not quite exactly the way we would put them in English, but uh, important from, from that 
they were at least able to send this letter in, 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 in a little bit broken English. So this is the trunk that the family had saved it in, the Berger family in America who received the letter. And again, this old trunk had been a repository of their family history. Their family had actually immigrated from Germany at the turn of the century. So here was this letter from 1939 among with sitting for for 60, 70 years in this old trunk amid a lot of other German documents. As I began my research, um, I was able to put together a little bit of a family tree. Alfred Berger, here's his, um, his birth and death dates, his wife Hedwig. Um, I learned that their daughter Martha was married to Leo and her last name was Sizes. Learning that, I was able then to start tracing her. Uh, and here is a second daughter, Gretel, not mentioned in the letter. That was a, a stunning di discovery also. So I began trying to trace the family trait. I was hoping there might be some descendants. Um, Alfred Berger's letter says his daughter is going to immigrate to America. So I, I researched um, Martha Sizes and found that she did have a daughter um, living in New York. I contacted Celia Sizes um, that was uh, an operation which took many steps to find her and many more steps to actually reach her, contact her. I, I found a phone number and I found an address for her. I called her phone number and left a message. I think I have a, a letter that was written by your grandfather and I, uh, I'd like to talk to you about it. I'm hoping to write a story about it. Um, I wrote her and called her for a month, a full month every single day. No answer, no answer, until finally I receive a message on my phone. Hello, this is Celia Sizes. I think you've been trying to reach me. So, yes, Celia, I, I was. Um, Celia was initially suspicious of me, a little, a little protective of her privacy, as anyone could understand she would be. And um, slowly, slowly, as we talked, as I told her the information that I already had found out um, about her family, she began to trust me and we became a team working together to uncover the story of her family that she did not know. Um, so a step at a time, doors began to open for me, um, unlocking this this story. The, another, the next door that opened to, for me was um, uh, another family member, extended family member, who was the grandson of Alfred Berger's brother. Alfred Berger's brother Herman had been able to escape early on <clears throat> after the Anschluss and uh, was able to bring um, crates of his furniture, his belongings, and his family records dating back, <clears throat> excuse me, to the 1800s um, with him to America. So, I, able, contacting Peter, who whose name was given to me as Peter, but whose name now is Ferd. Um, he can explain that if he chooses, but he has his name is now Ferd, and he will join us in a few minutes. Um, so Ferd most generously invited me and Celia to come to his home and look through his records. So I spent um, a very busy, oh, 14 hours a day um, for three or four days at his home, looking through boxes and boxes of his records. Walking in 
through that door into a room that he built on his house, which he called the Vienna Room, um, really opened the world of the Austrian Empire to me, the world before um, the Anschluss, the occupation of, of Austria. And it made the, all of a sudden, I began to see a picture of a, a wonderful close family. Um, I began to understand more closely their bonds their terror and their desperate efforts of both Alfred and his brother Herman to escape the Nazi terror. And I'm, I was um, surprised to see such a room that protected the past in this way. So I asked for to talk today about why he had built this room and what it means to him. So I'll just say a few. I'll just say a few talk? words, Ferris. Um, so how the Vienna Room came to be, um, you can see in the background behind me. It's a little hard to see, but it's a glass case filled with what I call, um, you know, high class chachkas uh, from Vienna, from Austria. And this glass case had been in my mother's house when she was growing up. It was in my house when I was growing up. And the only request my mother made before she died was that that case with everything in it should remain as it is after she passes away. So what to do, what to do with it? It led ultimately to Leslie and I deciding to build on an addition to our house, actually an addition of two rooms, the Vienna room being one of them. So the Vienna Room, I love giving tours of it. It's um, filled with a lot of stuff, as Ferris has said. Um, there are hundreds, perhaps thousands of letters, photos, tablecloths, menus from ships, documents of all sorts. And it reflects the fact that my grandfather, and I don't fully understand the story, was able to bring things with him, he and my mother. Um, they were not able to bring any money out, so they were actually quite poor when they got to the US, but they had all this stuff. So what this room means to me, it's very complicated. And, um, you know, on the one hand, it reminds me of growing up. It reminds me of my parents. It puts me in touch with my family roots. It's kind of neat to get these glimpses of history. So I really like being in it. And I'm especially glad that it could be useful to Ferris in her research. But it also brings up really mixed feelings that I have about Vienna, about Austria. You know, um, my parents, when they talked about their past, they talked about the good times. And that was in Vienna when they were in their teens and their 20s and 30s. And so it was kind of a happy uh, time. And um, they didn't talk so much about the oppression, about the anti-Semitism. But the reality is that Austria was a, a very anti-Semitic place. And um, I'm going to give a few examples of that. Um, around the turn of the century, the previous century, the mayor of Austria, who was widely loved, considered very progressive, in some circles considered a revolutionary, his name was Karl Luega. He was also known as a leading anti-Semite. When the Nazis took over Austria in 1938 in the Anschluss, Austrians streamed out and welcomed uh, Hitler and the Nazis to the extent that Hitler was actually very surprised at the reception, the positive reception that he got. And then um, I'll just say a couple more things. In 1959, a uh, little over 20 years after my parents fled, we went back to Vienna. It was obviously my first time there. And on the first day in Vienna, my mother went out on one of the main streets by herself and somebody who she didn't know, she didn't know anybody, 
just kind of purposely knocked into her and called her shitty Jew. So this was now 15 years, 14 years after the end of World War II. And what my mother always said was, Austria is too nice for the Austrians. So I heard that um, a lot. So, you know, as, as circumstance would have it, it turned out that eventually um, Austria changed its line. They used to say they were the first victims of Nazism, which on one level was true, but on the other hand, um, as I said, they really welcomed the Nazis. But they eventually changed their line and um, acknowledged that um, they too were perpetrators. And so they made available uh, reparations and made available um, the possibility for descendants of people who fled because of religious persecution to uh, get Austrian citizenship. So despite all my mixed feelings, I and my daughter actually applied for and received Austrian citizenship. So we're dual citizens. And the reason is really just to open up some possibilities for her if she ever wants to work in the e EU. But ironically, and this is the last thing I'll, I'll say, um, when Trump was in office and it looked like he might win a second term, Leslie and I, like lots of people, talked about, can we really stay in this country? And lo and behold, we actually talked about, well, maybe we could flee in reverse and go uh, to Austria where I'm a citizen. So lots of mixed feelings, but I just want to say how honored I am to be included in the book, in this event, and really just so grateful for Ferris to, for writing the book and helping me learn a lot more about my family. And if you haven't read the book yet, you'll learn more about it too. So I'll pass it back on to Ferris. Thanks, Thanks Ferd. And, and uh, yes, you were an amazing help. It was at your house that I found the first picture of um, Alfred Berger. Here he is in the background, um, standing behind Ferd's grandfather, Herman, his older brother, uh, with his siblings. Um, I think this picture is so interesting because each of the faces sort of reflects a different personality, um, as pictures will. Even this posed picture, you see Alfred Berger, I feel like looking very earnest, looking off into the future with some confidence um, and optimism. I would like to point out that he is the only one wearing glasses here, and they're already at, at this young age, which I'm thinking is about 15, 16, something in that area. Um, he's already wearing glasses. Those glasses would become thicker and thicker, and by the time he um, wrote the letter to America, he was legally blind. Here he is, a few years later, a few years later, um, looking very dapper with Hedwig. I think this is an engagement photo. Um, Alfred has this fantastic flaring mustache. His glasses are a little darker, a um, little thicker. Um, Hedwig, I think, looks beautiful. She has a hairdo which would be very stylish even today. And to me, she has this calm Mona Lisa sort of look on her face. Um, I think it's, it's just a wonderful photograph. So the family moves on. Um, and here are their two daughters. This is Martha, the older daughter, and the Gretel, who is um, about 10 years younger. The family is, is out for a walk here in the Vienna woods, a typical thing for a Viennese family to do on an afternoon is take a stroll in the Vienna woods. Um, this is, of course, before the Anschluss, which is the name given for the occupation of, um, of Austria by, by the Nazis. They, they still look 
like a happy, sweet family. Um, when I first received the letter, I had pictured in my own mind um, Alfred and Hedwig alone in Vienna uh, fighting this, this Nazi, struggling against this Nazi oppression. In fact, as I would learn, um, they had a large, ex close and warm extended family that saw each other frequently. Um, Ferd's grandfather doesn't happen to be in this picture that I have of a family gathering, but here is Alfred um, on, on the, in the back row. Martha, probably about 20. Um, she was studying at this point to be a, p a concert level pianist. And here is Hedwig standing next to her sister, um, who is her sister Olga, who is married to Alfred's brother Richard here. So this is a very close family, and these, these cousins are as close genetically as um, brothers and sisters, as siblings. In the front, um, a, and this is a, such a fantastic picture with these two youngest cousins, this is Gretel, Alfred and Hedwig's youngest daughter, and her cousin Ernst, who is um, the son of, of another one of Alfred's brother, Arnold. Ernst and Gretel are the only two wearing coats here. They've got their caps pulled low. And I just think this picture is fantastic. It shows these young people, it shows the whole family happy, relaxed, and these young, these two youngsters looking like they're ready for an adventure. And in fact, these two would have an adventure together. The family moves on again. Here's Gretel as a teenager. Here's Martha. Um, in her kitchen. She's married at this point. And here's her husband, Leo, in the background here, working on a painting. He was a, a wonderful um, painter, artist, as well as a very resourceful jack of all trades who worked um, selling wholesale goods, mostly leather goods, that his family in Poland produced. This innocuous looking piece of paper, and I'm sorry, it's, it's a bit, I'm sorry, um, it's a bit faded, uh, and it was faded when I came across it, a copy of it also. This is the young Ernst Berger, who we just saw in that picture as a child. Um, military record. When he turned 18, instead of going into the family business, which was textiles, he decided to join the Austrian army before the Nazis conquered Austria. This is his military record that shows he was in an infantry, the infantry. He was a sniper. His unit was sent first to the German-Austrian border to protect Austria against the Germans who were threatening to invade. When the president of Austria surrendered their country without firing a shot, nominally to prevent unavoidable mass bloodshed and an inevitable defeat, Ernst's unit was withdrawn to the capital, to Vienna. And it was charged with an unbelievable mission, and that was to now protect their former enemy, the, the Germans. So the Germans were making a triumphal and a rapid entry into Vienna. Um, the Germans were met throughout their, their journey across the, the country of Austria. They were met with blizzards of flowers and cheering people, people crying for joy um, at this, at this um, change in their status. They were now part of the German Reich and a, in a certain percentage, maybe not the majority, but a per, certain large percentage 
were Nazis and they uh, were very glad to be joined to Germany. So Ernst is now stationed in a window overlooking Hitler's triumphal um, entry into Vienna. He's got his rifle trained on Hitler's procession and the officers in the room as Hitler approaches leave the room. They knew that Ernst was Jewish and as Ernst later told his family, he believed that they were hoping he would solve their problem. Their problem was Hitler to them was still their enemy. He was, they, he believed they were hoping he would assassinate Hitler and he almost did. He had his rifles trained on, trained on Hitler who passed under the window, standing in his famous big open car, standing in the Nazi, in a fixed position of the Nazi salute. Ernst said he debated and debated as those minutes, those seconds passed, what he should do. And in the end, as we, of course we know, he did not pull the trigger. He feared, he said, the huge repercussions that would happen to, to German Jews, Austrian Jews, if it was found out that a Jew had assassinated their Fuhrer. So he did not he did not pull the trigger and um, we know the history that resulted from that decision. This is the last picture we have of the Berger, Alfred and Hedwig Berger's family together. You see what a very different type of picture it is from the group pictures we saw before of a happy, confident um, family. Here is Alfred. Um, his, eye, his glasses are thicker. He is legally blind at this point. And you see he's the only one not looking directly into the camera. His eyes here look like they've seen and witnessed um, just horrors. This is Gretel next to him. There's Martha and her husband Leo and Hedwig debating what they would do, planning each one would then have their separate paths through the Holocaust. Here are Martha and Gretel standing outside their apartment, their, their home that's been, been their home for their whole lives. Um, probably the day before Gretel would le leave uh, Vienna. She would be the first of the Berger family to escape. She had been active in the young Jewish Zionist movement in Vienna and Jewish organizations were quick to work to sponsor evacuations of these young people from Vienna to Palestine. She would board a train, a sealed train, that was um, approved by Alfred Eichmann himself, who wanted these, these um, young Zionist Jews out of the country. Um, so she and he, Alfred Eichmann, was at the train station watching and overseeing Gretel's departure. She traveled by the sealed train from Vienna down to Athens, Greece. And in Greece, she boarded, um, boarded a, she and, and the probably, oh, 400 other young Jews. Um, boarded a ship bound for Palestine. It was contracted with, uh, by a Jewish organization. Um, it was a Greek pirate ship whose previous uh, cargo had been bootlegged alcohol. So it was a terrible journey um, through rough seas. They were um, ev having to evade British warships and uh, British aircraft who did not want floods of refu Jewish refugees coming into Palestine, destabilizing um, the Arab population who would not want this flood of, of refugees either. So it was a perilous journey, but, but it turned out that it was a safe one. The, the ship anchored way offshore 
unloaded the, these young Jews who then had to swim ashore with their shoes tied around their, you know, tied together around their, hanging around their necks, a backpack on their back. But they landed safely and Gretel then would, would live safely in Palestine. Martha's husband, Leo, was the next family member to be able to escape. Here's Leo. This is a composite picture of Leo in the Havana Harbor. He managed to find a very expensive passage on, a re on an illegal refugee ship bound for Cuba, where people with Jews with affidavits with visas were um, waiting for their visa number to be called so they could enter America. Cuba was had been a safe place for Jews to wait. Leo was a, a special target of Hitler's wrath, being an undocumented Polish immigrant in Vienna. These Polish immigrants were being rounded up and uh, deported. Um, there their uh, future was grim. So here is, here is Leo. He, um, he, this is on the left, the um, Havana Harbor, the Havana docks and waterfront. In the background is a famous ship, the SS St. Louis, which reached the harbor just before Leo's ship did. Both ships were turned away. The corrupt, corrupt uh, Cuban officials who had taken bribes to allow these ships to come, these refugees to come, um, suddenly decided to raise their extortionary um, ex bribes and the Jewish organizations were not able to, to pay them. So Leo was here on the last day on the first day that the refugee ships were not allowed to, to enter. So the SS St. Louis uh, is, the is the subject of a movie called Voyage of the Damned. It was re had to return to its um, home port where, from which it had departed, which was Hamburg, Germany. There, these Jewish refugees, some of them with visas in hand, were able to then um, find other passage to America. Others were sent straight to concentration camps. Leo's ship, fortunately for him, had departed from France. So his ship departed from France. In France, Leo was immediately um, arrested um, and uh, put into forced labor with the French army who was uh, who was on high alert against a, a possible German invasion. When in fact the Germans did invade, the unit that, for, that uh, Leo was attached to was sent north first to Dunkirk to support the, the French uh, resistance there. And then when France crumbled, France's army crumbled, his unit ran south, and I, I do mean they ran, they turned and ran from the north of France south to Marseille, along with thousands and thousands of other French citizens, people from Belgium, Luxembourg, um, and the Netherlands, fleeing the Nazi invasion. Leo ended up in Marseille, uh, where his, and at the time his, his visa had expired. So, he, while waiting for a new visa, he hid in haystacks and he hid in the Pyrenees for almost two years, evading roundups of of Jews who were who were in Vichy, France. Vichy was the unoccupied zone of France, where um, the the head of the country was glad to cooperate and had begun uh, putting the Jews trapped there in concentration camps also. So Leo had another obstacle before he could 
um, reach America. Once his visa was renewed, he would be able to, he would then be faced with finding uh, transportation. But waiting, 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 the um, anti-Semitic State Department of the United States was holding up all of these um, Jews who wanted legally to enter the country. So Leo's paperwork was held up and held up for really a total of two years, as I said. Fortunately for Leo, there was a um, consul in Marseille who was signing the, um, the visas and that would permit Jews to enter America. When Leo's turn finally came up to be, um, to come in front of, of Hiram Bingham. Um, and he, so this is a very historic document. Hiram Bingham's uh, signature is on it. This is one of the last um, visas that um, Hiram Bingham signed when the State Department realized that they had a consul in Marseille who was permitting these Jews to enter legally. They transferred him to South America. His career was, in, was essentially ended. So this was um, Leo's um, passport, as, as you might say, into America, signed the last day it would have been possible for him to receive it. Martha, meanwhile, had a visa also, and she had not been a special target as her husband was. So she uh, was able to reach America in, um, in November of 1939, shortly after um, Alfred Berger wrote his letter. Here she is. She went down to the New York Harbor time and time again, looking for Leo to be on a ship. The mails were terrible, and um, she would receive a letter that had been written maybe three months earlier saying, my papers are in order, I'll be on this ship. And then Leo's plans would all fall apart and he would not be there. She waited time and time again. You can see this is, um, there. you don't see anyone hanging over the rails here, this empty ship. Uh, she waited until the last person left. Leo was not aboard this ship. This is a ticket. This is uh, Martha's ticket aboard the SS Washington that did arrive, as you see, the, last, the end of October 1939. These are samples of letters that Martha would receive over years, over a period of years from 1939 to November of 1941 from her parents, Alfred and Hedwig in Vienna. So I was able to see these letters uh, through the help and support of Celia Sizes, um, granddaughter of Alfred Hedwig, the daughter of Martha and Leo. You can see this letter from, is one of the earlier letters. The handwriting is fairly neat. Um, lots of the curly cues that were that were typical of the uh, of the handwriting of the day. Um, don't we all miss handwritten documents? Yes, we do. Yes. Um, Here is a later letter. You can see Hedwig's handwriting is still fairly good, but not what it oops not what it used to be. Here is Alfred's letter. Uh, his writing on the same letter. You can see how his vision has declined, and emotionally, probably he was not as as uh, secure and strong as he had been. Um, it's smudged, it's dark, it's practically unreadable. I had a terrible, really difficult time getting these letters translated, in large part because Alfred's head, handwriting was was so diminished. Oops, trying to, to, I am sorry, not the world's best tech person. Let me move this over to here so we can see, um, this is a letter that Alfred wrote to Herman 
Herd's grandfather, Alfred's brother. He was able to say in this letter to his brother things that he wouldn't say to his daughter. Um, the, the letters from Alfred and Hedwig to Martha were, were really unbelievably cheerful. They did not say because of censors um, exactly what was happening to them. There were hints you had to read behind, between the lines and you had to know what was happening all around them to decode what they were saying. But the letter to Herman has a shocking statement. I'm glad to report that Hedwig has returned from Nordhausen. When I was able to have this letter translated, I realized that Hedwig had been uh, deported herself uh, as forced labor in a concentration camp in Germany. At the time she was working there, it was really just a factory. She was, um, she was not beaten, she was not mistreated other than treated as forced labor. Uh, she was packing medicine in, in pills, in pill bottles. Um, Alfred, with his blindness, his, he had become legally blind, was able amazingly to petition the Nazi authorities to bring her back because he would need um, her assistance to live. So Alfred's blindness, which was such a handicap for so much of his life, turned out to have saved um, Hedwig from staying at Nordhausen, which would soon become a deadly camp where people were worked to death and the death rate was simply staggering. It was just a, a place from hell. Alfred and Hedwig Berger, these are, uh, this is a portrait that Leo painted from that, that picture of them around the table. The picture, and this is Hedwig, um, I don't have a late picture of her that showed what she was really like um, at the end of the time, her time in, in um, Vienna. She and Alfred would both meet their fates, different fates at the hands of the Nazis. Um, and you can see, especially from Alfred's face, the, um, the, the terror and the struggle, the, the burdens that they were under, the grief that they were suffering. This is a picture of myself, my husband, Sydney, and Celia Sizes, um, Martha's daughter. We traveled together to Vienna to um, uncover a lot of what happened in Vienna. Um, here I went to a number of archives and with, I was joined also by, um, by Gretel's, two of Gretel's children from Palestine, Mika and Judith. They, um, together we walked the streets where their grandparents had, had lived. We went to the apartments that Alfred and Hedwig lived in as they were pushed from one to the next and the next, increasingly more crowded and pushed together with other Jews until they were uh, put in Vienna's ghetto without walls from which they could not um, they could not leave. It was it was guarded, but it was not fenced. Ferd, do you want to talk here or a little later again? I'll let Ferd jump in in a minute. Um, this is the uh, these are the grandchildren of Alfred and Hedwig Berger, Judith and Mika from Israel, and Celia again, standing in the exact place that their mothers had stood as they were leaving, um, about to leave Vienna. This is the, their apartment building here. Um, these are not happy faces, although they did try to look happy. This was a very mixed experience very bitter and also um, 
somehow very satisfying for these grandchildren who had not really known their grandparents' story. Celia had known some. Um, Mika and Judith knew nothing. They said that when they asked their mother, Gretel, about their their grandparents, she would just cry. And so as young, even as youngsters, they learned not to ask anymore. So for them, all of them, this meant reclaiming their family. <clears throat> Hitler's Kampf, his mission, as he wrote in his, his um, famous book, Mein Kampf, had been to obliterate the Jews from Europe. His goal had been to leave a small like museum to the Jews in Prague taught you that would show this interesting ethnic, small ethnic group that once lived here. So this was a chance for the family to, this was an answer to Hitler, <coughs> cruelty and greed and um, terror for them to reclaim their family story. So, Ferd, would you like to talk here? Um, sure. I'll just say a couple of uh, quick things, and then I really hope to get to where people can ask questions or make comments. Yeah. But um, the postcard on the, on the right side of where you showed those letters was addressed to my grandfather at 215 West 88th Street, apartment 8H, which is, of course, exactly where I grew up. So I grew up with my grandparents in the same house. But I had no idea of any of this. It never occurred to me to think about what they had gone through, what their experience was. And that's why I was so um, excited to, after my mother died and I went through all these boxes and things, I found a lot of poetry that my grandfather had written. And it was mostly in German, but there was this one really moving poem that I'd like to read that's in English and that is really about what <clears throat> his experience of being a refugee. And I think it's really timely given <clears throat> the incredible flood of refugees all over the world now. It's only going to get worse with climate change. We have to understand how to treat refugees respectfully. So I'll just read this poem very quickly. It's called That's All They Brought Along. And he wrote this in 1941 at a time when he probably did not yet know what actually had happened to his siblings. So one of his siblings did escape and the other three did not, including Alfred. So in lonely nights when half awake I lull and dream, I see my birthplace, beautiful, the charming city at a river bright around the hills with wine so far and wide where lilac shrubs <clears throat> and breeze the branches swing and chestnut trees are blooming white in spring, a basket of smelling fruits always in fall and golden sunshine beaming through the all. Forefathers' tombs set in a peaceful place have places there of rest and flowers of love. Suddenly a gale is rushing o'er the lands, it violently tears from roots the plants and by its power it makes growing weeds where love has flourished, sprouts the hatred seeds. Mischief escaping men left goods and chattels, but flying the pursuits through troubles and battles, picked up the scattered corns of love divine, saving them carefully in a holy shrine. Came to these shores, that's all they brought along, trusting the sacred seed may prove so strong to yield anew in this blessed country soil, the ground once plowed and tilled by pilgrims toil. So far from east to west that longer stands in this sunball than other lands, spreading across a giant flag its beams where towns are stars and stripes the fields and streams. O oh, country, don't as aliens receive the persecuted brethren who believe what brought along and shrine as sacrifice may hundredfold in fertile soil arise. Thank you, Ferd. That's amazing. It takes you back to old Vienna and then to his longing for it. 
so I started out my my quest to understand what had happened to Alfred and Hedwig Berger with a certain set of questions. I ended up when I finished this book with a whole different set of questions, much deeper and much more far reaching. Um, this, the, the Berger story, ah, sorry again, trying to move that there. Um, the Berger story, the Holocaust was a huge and complicated event. It involved millions of millions of people, not just as victims, but as perpetrators or as so-called bystanders, people who passively did nothing. So there are so many questions that the story raises, but some that I have, am, you know, I'm bothered with myself um, relating to Alfred and Hedwig's story in particular is what would I have done if I had lived in America in 1939 and received Alfred Berger's letter? Would I have, how would I have responded? Would I have just put it away? Would I have thrown it away? Or would I have reached out risking um, what I might have felt like my own security? Um, remember 1939 was just a decade past uh, the Great Depression and unemployment was still at times around 20 percent, something our generations never experienced. So I have to try to put myself back in, in that position. What would I have done then? But what would I do now if I received such a letter? And I don't know that I have a good answer. Um, what, and I wonder what I would have done if I'd have lived in Vienna, not Jewish, um, in, in, under the Nazis. Would I have been passive and allowed things to go on, hoping not to have been murdered myself, as, as many uh, Viennese were who protested against the Nazis? What would I have done? Um, I don't have an answer, but it's a question that really reverberates um, with us today. Um, what and you wonder what can I do to to affect world events? Um, I think probably the burgers who received this letter in America felt like they probably couldn't do much of anything. They probably felt like. I don't believe they thought it was a crank letter or they wouldn't have saved it. I think they felt like they couldn't really make a big difference. They didn't believe in themselves as agents of empowered to affect these big events in the world. And yet they could have, they could have saved some lives. So the questions um, resonate with me and stay with me. I don't have answers, but I think they're important questions that arise from the book, among others, among many others. So with that, I'd like to um, open it up to questions with, with Ron uh, as the mediator, I think. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's an amazing story. I hope uh, people will purchase the book because it's well worth reading, to say the least. Um, if people have questions, you can either put it in the chat or just uh, speak up. Um, just unmute yourself and ask questions. I would like to just make a comment to uh, Ferris. Sure. I am uh, Liesl's first cousin. We're, we were 40, uh, Liesl, uh, Mitzi One's daughter, okay. uh, Ferd's mother, and she and I were first cousins and she was very, um, very close to me in my whole life or the whole time that she was alive. Uh, from the time I was a small child, I remember that cabinet for every time we got together. Uh, she came to visit my family in Colorado uh, many times for Christmas vacation. She knew my children very well. 
So um, I thank you very much, Ferris, for writing this book because although we were so close, I didn't know any of this. And I would even ask her, I remember when I was a teenager, I was learning about the Holocaust. I asked her, I said, what was it like coming to America? And she said, it was very hard. And that was it. Yes. She never told me anything. So anyway, thank no, you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for for sharing, you know, your experience too as a as a descendant of, of Holocaust victims. Um, victims did not mean just people who died, but people whose whole lives were upended and who experienced that horror. Um, I hear enough from, from, you know, people will write me and say, I never thought to look back. How did you do this? What resources did you use? Because I think people um, have hesitated. Many people have hesitated really to look back. Some people are glad to have, you know, shared their memoirs and stories, but others, um, there's a wall of pain that that people have to pass through in order to look back because the stories are so um, so upsetting. Um, so I'm you know I'm glad that that the story is opening up for you and I um, you know I I encourage everybody who who does have a a past affected by the Nazis to 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 go through that 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 painful um, experience of looking back. I was spared that because it wasn't my family. I certainly wept tears during the research and writing of this, but it was not my family. Um, so um, I encourage I encourage anybody who has this history to, to look back and to be a witness uh, for what happened and, and an inspiration that it not happen again. Um, other comments or questions? Ferris, is there any way that you could let the people know where they could get the book? Oh, sure. It's it's really available all kinds of places. You can go to Amazon. You can um, request it from your local independent store. It's um, cost is coming out in paperback in early June. And Costco will have a lot of copies of it. And, um, you know, it's Barnes and Noble has it. It's really going to, it is widely available now. And, um, and the price is going down of the hardback copy as the paperback comes, comes, um, you know, the date of that release, I think is the 8th of June. So it's available really everywhere where books are sold. Uh, there's a question in the chat about uh, where you got your information regarding the story of the Austrian sniper. That's an amazing story. Um, yes. Well, that's a sort of tangle. It's a story that's tangled up with another story. One, when, when I was in Vienna with um, Celia and Judith and Mika and my husband, um, also in Vienna, was um, the wife of Ernst, who's, um, and her name was Hertha. She came to Vienna, she loved Vienna, despite all the um, horror that had happened. She still had friends there, and she would come to visit in Vienna every year. Um, she would stay for a month. So one reason we planned our trip for a certain time was that she would be there. And I wanted to do that because I thought, oh, this is a person who knew Alfred and Hedwig Berger and who, although she escaped very soon after the Anschluss, just a few months after the invasion, um, she was there during that event. She could have been a wonderful witness. So I actually, we actually um, had an appointment to meet her there um, a certain morning and uh, Judith tried to call um, 
her her cousin and uh, her cousin's wife and no answer at the hotel, no answer. It turned out she had stu suffered um, a cardiac event the night before and was in the hospital. So um, she actually passed away while we were in, in Vienna. We, I was not able to, to talk with her, um, which, you know, that's not the worst part of it. The worst part of it was this family member you know, the family lost a, a dear member. But um, then her son, when she was in the hospital, her son, Amnon, who lived in Brazil, um, because that's where one part of the family had fled to, um, flew from Vienna to, from Brazil to Vienna to um, be with his mother in the hospital. And he was there in time to be with her. Um, but he, just on his own, he brought his father's military records for me. So it was a very thoughtful and um, generous um, act on his part to have copied his, his um, father's record and, and he gave it to me and, and told me that story, which, you know, his father had told him. So, uh, if I understand, um, this is a Leo's uh, son? No, no, no. So, there are a lot of characters in this book, and I had right. a long <laughs> it took a while to keep every, everything straight, and it took me a very long time to figure out how to, how to write about so many characters. That was something I wasn't um, accustomed to doing. I was accustomed to newspaper, you know, short, short pieces and tight deadlines. So, um, um, let's see, Ernst was the cousin you saw in, in the picture, the f big family picture on the steps with his arm around Gretel. Right. Ernst grew up, um, in, and then he fled with Gretel to Palestine. His brother, Willie had gone to, um, Brazil. Uh, he'd gone over the Alps, like, you know, like, the Sound of Music family, um, and then ended up in Brazil. So um, Ernst's, let's see, Herta's grandson Amnon um, came to Vienna when she was in the hospital, and he brought these papers. So it was it was Ernst's son who brought me those papers and told me the story oh okay uh, connect i had another question which is i guess a basic one too is how did both of them die that is they said how did this beautiful couple pass away alfred and hedrick yeah so i sort of avoid telling that so that people can read the book and find out um and i think i'll i'll stick with my with my idea that i won't tell that part of the story. Um, they had different deaths. Alfred died in Vienna um, and Hedwig was deported. So I will, I will say that much without details. Okay. They didn't survive, obviously, as we know. They did not survive. But their children did, that was amazing. I mean, yes, their two daughters did survive. Yeah. So, uh, other other questions, comments? I have a question. I would like very much to get a recording of this because I have relatives in Australia who are part of this family as well that we are in touch with. And they were trying to get online. I don't know if they were, but it, like six in the morning for them. Um, and um, my children who are all working who couldn't. Uh, attend so I really would like to um, and oh by the way your your book did go to Australia and has made the rounds in the family in Australia oh uh, that's amazing I'll yeah. let Ron answer that and then I have something to say about Australia okay um, Gary you want to respond to that? what uh, Gary you yeah. Want to, oh, okay yeah, yeah. We're, yeah we're being recorded as we speak <laughs> so, I mean, how uh, can she? How can they get copies of the of the recordings? 
Uh, I should have their emails. I should be able to send them an email and I'll send them a code. If not, they can go to the Bristol Community College uh, website. It'll be on there. Anybody in the world can get on there. So. Okay, so um, Gary can send you the thing, the code, okay. and the. Uh, Thank you. It usually uh, takes about a day to get it back from uh, Zoom. Sometimes they're sometimes they're faster than that, but most of the time it's like a day. Okay. I have a question about the St. Louis. Okay, let me just before. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, the journey of Gretel across on the on the Greek pirate ship from Greece to Palestine. Um, I was able in the book to describe that journey minutely just day by day because um, I, I came in contact with a, a woman who was a journalist. She herself was on that ship that Gretel was on, and she kept a diary. She wrote about what happened on that ship day by day by day. And um, she, li she lived for a long time in Palestine, but then she um, ended up moving to, to um, Australia. Her name was um, uh, Marta Trefus Painter. Her son still lives in, in Australia, and I've been in contact with him. But she was wonderful. She was so generous to send me. First, she told me she didn't want to do this, <clears throat> that she was going to write her own book. But as, right after she said that, suddenly I started receiving every day another email where the story just poured out about uh, her, her own family history. So um, that's how I found out about that. And that's an Australian connection to this story. Thanks. Um, somebody has a question. Are you still in touch with Celia? Oh, yes. Yes, Celia and I became friends and as did the Israeli grandchildren. And um, so I talked to her, you know, regularly. Other questions that people have or comments? I have one on the St. Louis. Okay. I think um, the author mentioned something about some of the people, if I understood it right, did go to America. And, and of course, how the um, some, of course, if not most, went to a concentration camp. So I have an article from the, the BCC, no, not BCC, BBC. Um, so I've done some research recently on the Holocaust. And as we know, you know, the ship was turned back because of Cuba, because of the um, United States under Roosevelt. According to this article, Belgium, France, Holland, and the UK agreed to take the refugees. The American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee posted a cash guarantee of $500,000 or $8 million in today's money as part of an agreement to cover any associated costs. But we all know, you know, that the Nazis took over these countries and it says 254 passengers from the St. Louis were killed as the Nazis swept across Western Europe. But, yeah. but America, I don't know, maybe some did. I never heard personally that any did go to America after the incident. They may have, if they had, if they had valid visas, um, they, they may have. Um, and I think that story is, you know, historically um, a, a major piece of Holocaust history. And so it's, yeah. um, it's available to find out how many went to which places. But that ship, <clears throat> after it sat in the harbor for a number of days, oh. um, negotiating between the, the Jewish organization in America and the yeah. Cuban, Cuban government, right. it went up the coast of America trying to find any port that would allow it. Yeah. And it went up 
I'm not sure if it went up as far as Canada, but then it also went down um, into Central America. Nobody would take these right. refugees. Right. All countries in the world had just slammed shut their their um, borders. Yeah. And some of the European countries like Belgium and so forth, those people eventually didn't make it because of the uh, Nazi. Right. They, well, so it was a very, very bad scene. And uh, according to the article I read, you know, the people when they were on the St. Louis, they were so full of hope. And so, and they, the food was so good there and the atmosphere. And, and then, you know, when, when they got that horrible news from Cuba, the Cuba just backed down. They were supposed to take them. It was um, it was horrific for them. One man even jumped into the water, you know, committed suicide. So it was it was like you say, major piece of Holocaust history. Um, another question here: Could you elaborate yeah. on your research process in Vienna? In Vienna, how easy was it to access the archives? Um, I made arrangements in advance, um, and most of the, um, most of the archives were so helpful. Um, the city of Vienna, um, I had been in touch with a certain archivist who handled these more historic records, and he was just wonderful. He gave me records of, um, the whole family, where did they live? So I was able to trace the family's movements around the town. And um, even today, citizens of Vienna are required to register in a way that Americans are not. If they move from one apartment to the next, they go to their local registration office, which is, it always was, a police office, a neighborhood police department. and. Just write down where you moved, who's with you. In, in 1939, you know, and forever, people had to write their religion, your your profession. Um, so those records were enormously helpful, as was the archive. I think it's become a little bit more um, bureaucratic or something, a little more difficult, as more and more people have asked for help from the city of Vienna. But that is a wonderful resource. Um, the Jewish community organization, still active and going in Vienna, um, has terrific records on all the families. And there is a, an organization, which I can't pronounce the name of, um, but the acronym, acronym is D, O with an umlaut over it, W. Um, it is an organization that was founded in part by the Austrian government. Um, to hold records about that period of time, um, about the Austrians who did, um, um, who were resistors to the Nazis, um, but also about the Jews. And um, the historian at that archive was enormously helpful. And I think the archive is still very, um, glad to help people. Um, I went with several of the Berger family members who wanted to come with me to that archive. Um, it's called documentation. You know, it's all in German. The reader's stand. I bet Fert could say it. Um, um, they, you know, they had us into their office and they told us in person what had happened to Alfred and Hedwig. Um, so they were they were a wonderful resource. Right now, of course, um, what didn't exist when I was doing research was in Germany, Bad Arlson, the archives there. It's B-A-R-E-L-S-E-N, I think, or S-O-N, um, has collected a huge amount of the um, records of the camps and all the SS operations. So it's an enormous resource, um, which may now be digitized. Can you um, say that first name again? The first? Of Bad Arlson? Yes. Can you say that? BAD. I think it's named after the area it is. Bad means like bath. 
Um, so it's a city where there were, you know, like health, health, health baths, you know, mineral springs and all. So Bod Arlson, A R E L S O N or S E N. Um, hi, could I, could I ask a question? Of course. Hello. Go ahead. Go after your question. Oh, Chuck. Is um, that yeah. Hi. Um, I'm representing the Australian family because I think a lot of them are still asleep because it's very early in the morning. But <laughs> th oh. thanks to thanks to Ferd and Emily, we received a copy of the book, and I ordered another one from Amazon, which came very quickly. And Ferris, it was a heart wrenching, wonderful read especially for Monica. And I have one question. I've read a lot about the Holocaust. Do the Austrians feel a twinge of remorse about the shocking treatment that went on? Because we know the Germans have done a lot to try and repair the damage with Holocaust education, with reparations to Israel. But I have the feeling that the Austrians are a little bit reluctant to admit that they welcomed the Fuhrer with such glee. Yes, it's a complicated question. I think Ferd could speak some more to it too, because he's been in touch with um, the country, with the state of Austria. Um, it's been a very mixed and up and down path since you know, since the war ended. Um, Austrians loved to claim that they were victims and surely they were victims, um, many of them. It was, n the Nazis were not the majority party, the majority of Austrian people. Um, but the, it doesn't take a majority um, to take over a country. So um, many Austrians felt that they were victims and um, were resentful of um, how they had been pummeled during the war. Um, you know, all the different nations who were um, coming from different directions, the allies and then the Russians from the east came into, came into Vienna and uh, there was great destruction. Vienna was bombed. Um, so, it's a very mixed and complicated reaction. Um, they, the Austrians, you know, had a president who had been in the SS for a number of years. Um, they also had a president who was Jewish for a number of years. Um, so it's been an evolving relationship um, between Jews and in the country. Um, Mika from, from, you know, Gretel's daughter uh, from Israel recently was contacted. Um, there is a park being um, with a memorial wall just being instituted in Vienna and um, plaques have been put up around Vienna um, about places where the Holocaust happened, um, where events happened to Jews. And there have been um, embedded like, you know, uh, foot, you know, bronze plaques in the sidewalk where uh, something happened to Jews or where Jews had lived. So there's a very mixed reaction, I think. Um, and there are a lot of um, Arabs who have moved to Vienna and Austria, a lot of Muslim people. And so I think, um, the current relationship between the Arab war world and Israel um, plays a part in mixed react mixed um, happenings in in um, Vienna towards the Jews. But I think that generally Austria has moved from really pretty complete denial to um, a moderate a moderately um, a moderately generous but mixed, um, ex, you know, um, acceptance of their their guilt. Yeah, I would I would echo that. Um, I don't really have a lot to 
add, except that I think the younger generation in Austria, you know, as the older generation has died off, there's been a generational shift. And what I would love to figure out how to do more is getting the book in to, to Vienna for people to read uh, there and ideally to even get it translated. I have sent it to the one friend I have in Vienna who herself is a refugee, she's Kurdish. Um, but I don't know, Faris, if you've had other ways of getting the book uh, to Austria. Yeah, no, I haven't. Um, and as, a, as an indication, an example of how Austrians have, like Germany, um, have um, reacted to their past and to you know, those who have a, a feeling of guilt, um, the Austrians, when, when there were the big um, whole, you know, floods of refugees coming out of the Middle East and who was going to take them and they were coming in boatloads, landing on the Greek islands, landing here there. Austria, while America closed its doors um, to, to most of those refugees, um, Austria took a much higher percentage for their population, much higher percentage than we did. So I think um, Austria has changed a fair amount. Well, you know, I don't know. I can't say, I, I'm just not an expert on the current, current status of, of um, Jews in, in Austria. But I know that progress has been made and that Israel and Austria have worked together on that. I think Francis had a question. Uh, Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, I'm curious to ask Ferris if your professional trajectory has changed after doing this kind of research and writing. Good question. Uh, <coughs> um, I, I may be starting on another book that relates to the Holocaust, actually. So you're on a new journey. Thank so you. Can, so I we can get you back uh, at some point, Ferris? Once your book is finished, <laughs> maybe a while, but it won't be. It won't be the decade that this book took me. Okay, we hope we'll be able to get you in person when we. Uh, you could do book signing. Good, yeah. Who knows? That time may be coming. I hope so. Yes, so, don't. Somebody, well, we'll t somebody mentioned in the chat that uh, phys Jewish physicians who left uh, Europe and came to the United States had a hard time with the American Medical Association. Uh, willing to uh, accept them. So uh, that may have occurred with other professions as well. I know there were people who were able to teach, especially in Southern, like uh, um, uh, African-American colleges, they got positions, some of the professors in those places, but it's not easy to be a refugee. Americans um, believed at that time, many Americans believed in this whole theory of eugenics, which was sort of um, genetically different races. There's a hierarchy of races and some really were more superior than others. And um, the Jews were considered a separate race from the Western Europeans who, you know, who dominated the culture. Um, and there was terrific anti-Semitism um, in the country for for many, many years. Yeah, that's true. And people don't realize after the war it kind of lessened, although as we see it bubbling up in the, in, <laughs> so it, some of it went underground, unfortunately, and now is uh, emerging, which is why we try to do the programs that we do. That's part of our, our, our mission is to do this kind of education so we know what happens when people you know, basically hate the other, whoever the other is, in this case, Jews, you know. Um, any other comments that would, we don't hold? Yeah, I just had, I had one comment. Um, sure. Um, my name is Harneen and I'm an um, old, old friend of Ferd's. And um, I read the book and I just, um, you know, it felt like it read like a, uh, you know, kind of a horrific thriller in some ways. Like I just couldn't put it down towards the end. And um, I am just so amazed at all the 
documents that you were able to access. And knowing FERD, I guess I shouldn't be surprised that so much was available um, and that um, FERD has so much from his family. But it must have been just uh, kind of an amazing experience to connect with him and realize that all those documents were existed. And that combined with the letters kind of back and forth during those last, that last, you know, kind of year and a half, I guess, um, in the family. I mean, I don't know. I mean, it just, I thought it was, you did an incredible job at telling the story and using, um, you know, this very, these original painful documents that told kind of, of the, the horror and the fear and the sadness and the pain and the loss. And I mean, following Leo it was like, oh my God, you know, I couldn't believe he left, he got out. And like every corner, every, you know, every angle was like a dead end and kept trying. And, um, you know, it's certainly, you know, I mean, just on a, a personal level, I just feel like, I mean, I haven't talked to Ferd about it, but there you are, Ferd, I'm looking at you. I mean, I just feel like as your friend, like it just, you know, the history then of families, you know, I'm Jewish, I have, you know, my own Jewish history of people coming here and when, but I don't, but it the, the kind of trauma, I think that this series of events then passes down in generations that families grow up with, um, of their own parents and grandparents and the loss and the trauma they suffered and just how it gets absorbed and it just was incredibly moved and um you know thank you for writing it for thank you for your work on it and um i really just you know i don't have really much else to say i just wanted to i'm happy to be here and, and hear you ferris um and just acknowledge what a, a gift it is to be able to bring to light kind of this in such a personal way, this story, which is just one family, one, yes. one family of, of millions. And so anyway, just wanted to just to share that. So thank you. That's why these stories are so important because yeah. they do make the Holocaust real. <laughs> and I, I do want to <clears throat> say too that, um, I kind of thought that I was pretty much done with my research at one point. Um, <laughs> at one point, which turned out to be fairly early in, in my research, um, when I got a call from Celia um, saying, oh my God, you won't believe what I found. And what she had found was um, a, the suitcase, several suitcases full of letters the letters that Alfred and Hedwig wrote um, to Martha. Um, and that, you know, that was a real turning point. Celia had shared with me a lot of documents and photos, but I had felt that Alfred and Hedwig were still um, not real people. I didn't know them well. Their voices weren't, you know, I couldn't write from, from yeah. anything would approach their feelings. I could try to do it, but it was not authentic. And then she found these letters. And so I, um, I do want to say that that was a, um, a huge part of, of the book too, finding, you know, a hundred or more letters um, from Alfred and Hedwig themselves to America. Um, Ferd's letters were incredible, and Ferd's grandfather, Herman, also, he, he was a very um, high-ranking official, both in the textile industry and also he had a, I don't know what you would call it, kind of post um, representing his, in, his industry in the city of Vienna, um, and was used to keeping very careful records and so he even had like, Ferd showed me financial records that Herman kept that showed how he was able to help support family members who were not as well off during this time, hoping that they would be able to um, um, use that to escape. 
So there's a lot of lot of connections having to do with with records that um, I I was just so fortunate people had had saved Herman as you know as well as um, the, you know the letters that Martha Berger saved. That's why it's important to save these <laughs> these letters and pictures and photographs because that's our connection with the past. Um, well, anyway, uh, you know, we can uh, want to thank you so much uh, for uh, for this presentation and for your book, and thank you, Ferd, for your participation. Thank you, Gary, Judy, everybody <laughs> here, um, and uh, it was a, gr a great way of uh, finishing our series in in this spring. This spring, and um, I'm sure more people will then get a little more in depth after they read your book but yeah. uh, good luck on all that uh, thanks thanks so much ron and, and gary for your work it's very important and and we all benefit from it thank you for your work yeah thank really. you for your inspiration M many people in the chat are thanking you and, and feeling you know appreciate the work and i really want to thank you I want to thank my friends and family who took the time to be on this uh, call. That really, means a lot to me. Well, good. We're glad we were able to provide that. <laughs> that means, um, and again, uh, this is all be recorded so people can uh, be uh, seeing it again, or those who missed it will be yeah. able to hear it again. That's yeah. the wonderful thing about this. Uh, I mean, even though I like to do things in person and we do video tape when we do things in person. So we do have a record as well, but this is a good way of keeping it. So um, great. Again, thank you so much. I hope uh, someday to uh, further you give, do you give tours of the Vienna room? No. You say no? Uh, not yes. during the pandemic. But, oh yeah. not to, But and, otherwise, yeah. Oh, all right, good. We'll Otherwise, have to, yes. We'll have to come down. The Western I'd Mass. love it if you came, Ron. Oh, I'd be happy to do that. And uh, some of it, some of us will come. All right. Anyway, yeah. thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Ron. Have a good night. Thank you, Ron. Enjoy thank the rest you. of your time. Thank in, you, uh, everybody. It was very, thank very, you. very much.